Good morning and welcome to Shiloh Church's uh, Sunday morning service. We're so glad you're here. Psalm 106 verse 3 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. So let's worship together. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So good, so good. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are good all the time. All the time. You are good. You are good all the time. All the time. You are good. You are good. you 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, oh, who you are. Oh, we worship you, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, oh, who you are. Oh, who you Welcome to Shiloh today. Thank you so much for being with us in our service. This is our seventh installment of our quarantine services. This is beginning the seventh week of what we have been referring to as kind of a stay at home or a safer at home type of relationship that we have with one another. We are trying to do some social distancing. It's very difficult for us to do. But be much in prayer for us. I'm Joe Bowles. I'm the pastor here. Uh, we want to thank you for being a part of our broadcast today. And let's begin our service by going to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. God, you're gracious and kind to us. Bless us at this time that we have spent together. Lord, your name is uplifting uh, in everything that we do. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to come to this earth and die on the cross so we could live forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. To God.
Yes, Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun. Father, we thank you so much for being here with us. We thank you for this beautiful service that we are worshiping your holy name. Father, we just ask you to be with our membership as they're watching us and praising you and reading their Bibles and just following everything that we're bringing before them and putting it in their hearts, not just their heads. We thank you, Father, for the teams that are here to worship your holy name. We thank you that our pastor is here to, to give your word and to give us the 
the privilege to just honor you and, and, and lift you up. Dear Heavenly Father, you truly are the healer of this, this virus that's going around the world. We know that you're going to take care of this. We do not have any fear. We love you, dear Heavenly Father, and we just ask for your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct Pastor Joe as he brings the word. In your precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. Surely as the sun rises in the east, as certain as a river flows to the sea, just as the winter promises spring, Lord, you are in everything forever.
welcome, welcome everybody to our broadcast. We are beginning either our seventh or our eighth week of our quarantine, depending on if you go by what our county did as opposed to what our, our governor did. I know it's been difficult for many of you, but this is something that I believe our leaders feel like we have to do. We do see light at the end of the tunnel, and so therefore we are making plans to gradually open our church. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that you'll be able to worship again. He brought me some water. Uh, we, we do not have a timetable, and it'll be a little bit different when we come back and until we're able to kind of deal with this virus effectively. Today and for the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking to you about the choices that we make in life. Do you, do you ever get tired of making choices? Do you ever get tired of making decisions in life? Because I do. Seem like I do that all the time. You go out and eat, you just can't even eat anymore because they come up to you and they ask you, what do you want to drink? And you have to tell them what you want to drink. And then they say, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what's your appetizer? And if you pick salad, then you got to pick what dressing that goes on the salad. And then your entree, you, they ask you how you want it fixed. And then it goes on and on and on. I went to the doctor the other day and, I, and the doctor or the nurse gave me uh, um, a clipboard, and it had four or five pages on it, and it asked me just tons of questions. Sometimes it was just boxes that I had to check, you know, if I ever had this, ever, ever had that, ever had the measles, or smallpox, or tuberculosis, or muscular dystrophy, or, M or PTSD, or scurvy, or smallpox, or black plague, or Rocky Mountain mountain spotted fever it was ridiculous and now they ask have I been out of the United States lately well I think it's none of their business but I had to spend all that time making decisions deciding if I had or I had not we're going to look at choices for the next several weeks that we all have in life we understand that most of our choices turn me up just a little bit so those on the balcony can hear me as we look at the choices that we have in life we understand that most of the choices that we make affect us. It affects our future. We also understand that there are consequences to our choices. And much of the time, the choices that we make can either drive us away from God or can lead us closer to God. Sometimes our choices lead to happiness that we've talked about the last couple of weeks. And at other times, they may lead to misery. But we make choices all the time. And we need to stop and make sure that the choices that we make line up with God and God's Word and His desire for our life. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. And while you're turning there, let me ask you this question. Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you make the choices that you make? What are the forces that influence you on a daily basis? Why do you do the things that you do? Well, I hope that the Bible is your guide because we're going to consult the Bible. And I implore you to do whatever the Bible says in every choice that you make. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about choices that affect our future. Choices that affect our future. And the choices we're going to be talking about today has to do with forgiveness. We make all kinds of choices when we uh, think we've been hurt and when we sometimes have hurt other people and we have to go to them. And so there's, there's these decisions that we make that have to do with forgiveness. And there may be those of you who are watching this broadcast today who are having a hard time with forgiveness. I mean, you want to forgive someone, but you're having a hard time doing so because the offense that they have done to you seems next to impossible to forgive. So I want you to listen today, and if, if it would help, I'd get on my knees and beg you to listen. Now, the reason I want you to listen is because I believe that this message is the key to solving every disagreement. It is the key that can take care of resolving every fight. It is the key that can help save marriages and relationships and friendships. It is the one thing that can restore 
restore joy in your life, can give you peace in the midst of trouble and turmoil. It can help you to release your feelings of hatred and resentment and bitterness and fear and revenge and retribution. And I, I honestly believe that what I'm about to say today can help you move forward in your relationship with God and with other people more than any other truth that I have ever shared with you. So I want you to focus, okay? I want you to focus your eyes and your minds on this truth that I'm going to share with you. It is found in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Here it goes. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. That's a sum of money. We're going to talk about that later. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He forgave him of the 10,000 talents. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him, owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me, Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him unto the tormentors, that he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Did you notice that? Forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. If there is a word that should be the operative word for our lives, it is the word forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the most important words that we will ever learn and one of the most important things that we will ever do. And to be honest, we struggle with forgiveness all of the time. At first, it seems to be easy, especially when we were kids. You had a fight with a neighborhood kid, you were playing with him the next day. We forgive so easily, so freely, and then we just sort of move on. But as we get older, it becomes harder and harder to do. And without the grace of God, forgiveness can be next to impossible to master. But if we fail to forgive, our lives are headed for disaster. You see... Unforgiveness can cause you to carry around feelings of guilt as well as having grudges or resentment or anger or bitterness for years. Unforgiveness will also eat away at your personality. It will rob you of your joy. It will steal your compassion. And you will develop into a person that most people will try to avoid. Most people aren't going to like you. Unforgiveness kills relationships, and unforgiveness will keep you from looking back at your life and saying, I had a good life. I had a good life. And the reason you can't say that is because you've allowed other people to ruin your life. You've allowed whatever harm they've done to you to control your, you throughout your life. And 
at whatever point you have allowed unforgiveness to control you, it is at that point that your emotional maturity and spirituality have come to a halt. And there are many people who have come to the end of their lives wishing that they would have exercised forgiveness like our Lord Jesus did toward us. Can you imagine anyone forgiving you like God has? Can you imagine if you were God forgiving you for all of your sins? Could you be as forgiving as God is? Probably not. Because His forgiveness is amazing, isn't it? And we know since God does forgive us that we need to be forgiving toward others as well. And it doesn't matter whether we have been hurt four minutes or for four days or for four weeks, or for four months, or for four years, or for four decades. The hurt can be as fresh as it happened moments ago. But we also know that forgiveness is a choice, isn't it? It's like everything else in our life. We have control over whether or not we forgive. We make choices to forgive or not to forgive. Now, the story that we read a little bit earlier is the story of a man who offended another man, and he receives forgiveness, and he is gloriously released from his debt, and then he turns right around and goes to a man who's offended him, and he refuses to forgive him. Now, I know that they're talking about forgiveness of debts here. But the principle applies to money or slander or pain or betrayal or persecution or any of the other things that may cause harm to another person. And this is a story that is being played out every day in the lives of nearly everybody. They have been forgiven by God for a multitude of transgressions, but they have refused to forgive somebody else for one offense. And not only that, but they'd like to even get they'd like to get even with that person. They would love revenge. Not only are they unforgiving, but they want to get them back. Listen, whoever said revenge is sweet has never stood there over a, with a bloody sword in their hand standing over an opponent. Because there's nothing very sweet about seeing someone else fall. In fact, it is hollow and it is empty. When you've delivered the blow because you think your enemy should get his. Now let me clarify something. There is a difference between punishment being meted out as a form of justice from what an individual does to try to even the score. You see, the government has a right and a responsibility to render an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, so to speak, but we don't. As individuals, if we adopt that policy for very long, we'll end up being toothless and eyeless. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So vengeance belongs to God and not to us. In fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if a man smites you on the cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. Now, the story that we read just a few minutes ago, it doesn't need a whole lot of interpretation, does it? It is a fairly obvious story, and the lesson that Jesus is trying to get across, I think, is very clear. But the Holy Spirit wants to convey four, four truths to us in the story, okay? Here they are. Number one, the servant owed a real debt to the king. Number two, the king had every right to expect payment. Number three, the king voluntarily forgave the servant. And number four, the king covered the loss with the cancellation of the debt. So keep these four things in mind, okay? Now let me get real personal. Do you think that there are circumstances in your life in which it would be wrong to forgive? I argue with a man probably about six months ago this point for a long period of time. And he had all the rebuttals to everything I had to say, but none of them rang true. Because he was not willing to forgive somebody for what they had done to him. Please understand that there are some people who argue that there are times in which the best thing for you to do 
when you've been offended or hurt is to not forgive, to refrain from forgiving. And they use some logical reasons for not forgiving, and they legitimately believe that. Number one, these are untruths about forgiveness. Number one, forgiveness denies the seriousness of the offense. Now, we know that's not true, don't we? They believe that if we forgive somebody, it means that what the person has done is not very serious. But please understand that forgiveness is not the denial of the offense or the denial of the hurt that they have done to you. You're not denying that they've done something just because you forgive them. Dear, Dear friend, please understand that every sin is serious to God. Every sin. Every breach of fellowship between people is a serious matter to God. And the reason it's serious is because God knows what sin has cost him. He also knows what sin leads to. And just because we have a wonderful, benevolent, kind and forgiving God, never think that God considers the harm that somebody has done to you as anything but serious. Somebody has hurt you, it's a serious thing to God. And when you forgive them, that does not mean that God does not think it's serious or that you don't think it's serious. The second argument against forgiveness is that forgiveness lets people off the hook too easily. You might be like that. You you think that if you forgive somebody that's hurt you, that that just gives them the opportunity to hurt you again or even hurt other people even more. Some people have the legitimate concern that if you forgive them and you're letting them off the hook, you're doing so because you are kind of winking at what they did. You let them off the hook. You let them get by too easily. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought about that? And let's be honest. We think I'll not forgive them because they'll just do it to me again. Or to somebody else. Now in our story, when Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times should we forgive somebody who has offended us? And he kind of throws out a number to Jesus. Uh, Should we forgive them up to seven times? Because that's kind of what the, the cultural element said in that day. Forgive somebody seven times, they don't have anything to do with them. But Jesus answered and said, no, 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 no. Let's not forgive them seven times, but... How about 70 times 7? He was basically saying this. If you're counting, you're not forgiving. If you're counting, you're not forgiving. Honestly, now, do you think that if we fail to forgive someone that it will somehow magically keep them from being offensive and hurting you again or others again? Maybe the real answer as to why we fail to forgive is that it's a convenient way for us to harbor unforgiveness and potential revenge in our hearts just a little bit longer. But there's another argument that is used to keep us uh, from forgiving people, or argument against forgiving people, is that forgiveness places too much responsibility on the victim. Have you ever been offended, and somehow the whole thing gets turned around, and instead of you being the victim, it looks as if you're the guilty person? And how it gets turned around is because you are caring and compassionate and others expect you to make the first move toward reconciliation. And you say, there ain't no way. I'm the victim and I'm not going to seek them out and I'm not going to forgive them. It's up to them to come to me. But as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? Now, I'm not advocating that we should admit to something that we did not do. I'm not saying that we ought to exhibit a lack of integrity and admit to something we're not guilty of. But what I am saying is this. The most important part of forgiveness is that when it's all said and done, then the victim gets or gains a a clean heart. Did you get that? The victim whose heart is clear, it's not the offender. It's the victim. Their heart is clear. In fact, the, the, the offender's heart may not be affected at all. The fourth reason or argument that some people use to keep from forgiving others is that forgiveness is unjust. They say that there are just some sins that are unforgivable. 
But if we believe that, then we take upon ourselves to determine something different than what God has already determined. God said there is one sin that is unforgivable, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So if God said that all sins are forgivable but one, then we fail to forgive, and when we fail to forgive, we are making ourselves the judge that determines what punishment should be meted out and that we will make them pay because to us their sin is unforgivable. We are now acting in the place of God. Dear friend, God does not allow us as Christians to take that position. We are not the judge. God is the judge. Now listen, we are never in a position to judge because we are not all-knowing. We don't know all the circumstances. We don't know all the details. In fact, we see things only from our own perspective. <clears throat> so God says, let me handle the judging. You just obey my command to forgive. Let me be the judge. Now, those four arguments that people give for failing to forgive have no basis in the Word of God. That's the reason that the Bible and our logic sometimes differ. But the Bible does share with us some truths about forgiveness, and there are many. Let me go over them with you, okay? One truth I know about forgiveness is that forgiveness is not optional with God. Now, we do have options, we do have choices, but God's Word says that unforgiveness is not an option. The Bible tells us that God's ways are higher than our ways. And there comes a time in which you must trust God's wisdom over yours. You see, my rationale sometimes leads me to conclusions that seem logical and natural, but they're not based on God's Word. <clears throat> and the final authority in every choice that we make is God's Word. You see, you and I, you and I must choose forgiveness because God's Word tells us that there's only one choice that we have that will keep us in line with God's will, and that is to forgive. In fact, here's what Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 say. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice, be kind one to another, tenderhearted. Here's the next word, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Does that sound like a suggestion or a command? So forgiveness is not an option with God. And also, secondly, forgiveness is not denial. We mentioned that sort of in passing earlier. Now listen, forgiveness is not denying the reality of pain. Forgiveness is not acting like you weren't hurt. Forgiveness is not saying, oh, that really didn't bother me. <laughs> listen, if you're hurt, you're hurt. And if we are the offender, on the other hand, we shouldn't say, hey, you shouldn't have such thin skin. You shouldn't have gotten hurt by that. Or you're such a baby. Listen, that's what somebody says when they know they have offended you. And they're trying to throw the blame over to you. But if you're the person who's been offended and hurt, the honest thing for you to say is this. I am hurt. You've hurt me. You might even be seriously wounded. By being forgiving, you are not denying the pain, but instead, by the very act of forgiveness, you are turning the offender over to God. You're not saying you weren't hurt, nor that you're letting them off the hook. You're doing what is best for the kingdom of God, and you're doing what is best for you, your own heart and mind and spiritual walk with God. So forgiveness is not denying the pain, but also is not letting the offender off the hook. You see, you don't have the power to forgive. I'm sorry, the power to pardon. You just have the power to forgive. Pardoning someone else belongs to God. You are just to do the forgiving part, okay? That's all. You don't need to determine any punishment. That's not up, you, not, uh, up to you to absolve them from guilt or to pardon their misconduct. You are simply to forgive. Then thirdly, forgiveness is not unfair. Listen, forgiveness is always fair. And here's what I mean. 
Forgiveness carries with it a release with some type of an obligation. With debt, it is forgiveness of the debt. That means the other party does not have to pay. When we forgive, we are actually overlooking another person's transgressions. And here's what I mean. We are not excusing their sin, and we're not acting as if the sin uh, was never committed. But we overlook the sin by placing it in somebody else's care, in somebody else's charge. And with every sin that has ever been committed, somebody has to pay for that sin, right? If that be true, why did the king release the servant from his obligation? Well, the answer to that was this. Forgiveness may be the only way to settle some debts. In our story, the servant's debt amounted to, in today's money, when you compare these 10,000 talents to today's money, that servant owed his king seven billion, not million, seven billion dollars. And there was no way in a thousand lifetimes that that servant could ever repay that debt. And from that story, we learn this. There are some people who are watching this broadcast who have been hurt and offended by people, and the damage that they've done to you can never be undone. Can never be undone. In your past, somebody may have molested you, and now they're dead, and their offense to you can never be made right again by them. Or in your past... You have been divorced, and you can never go back and undo that divorce. Your ex has hurt you, but now they've moved on. Or you may have been crippled or hurt by somebody that you don't even know, or you may ever know, and it can never be made right again. And I can go on and on with different scenarios, but the bottom line is this. Some debts can never be repaid. They can never be made right again in this lifetime. And as a result, you can either carry that burden with you the rest of your life, or you can release it. You can make them pay. You can't make them pay anymore. It cannot be done, undone what they've done. The only way you can be free from the pain that they've inflicted upon you is to forgive them. And it's your choice. You can either forgive them or not forgive them. That's up to you. That's your decision. But when you fail to forgive them, you allow the molester or the abuser or the betrayer or the attacker to haunt you the rest of your life. And oftentimes, even from the grave, do not allow them to hurt you one more time, one more day, one more second. God teaches us that when we forgive someone, we release them. But basically, we are the ones who are setting ourselves free. And there's some of you who've been offended in ways in which there's no possible way for the offender to ever make restitution. To ever, to ever make things right. You can either forgive them and release them to a holy God or carry that burden the rest of your life. And then fifthly... Forgiveness is your release. Forgiveness is the only thing that releases you to live the rest of your life. Therefore, today is a good day to start living. Don't let some schmuck or some jerk or some abuser or some thief to steal the rest of your life, to ruin your future, to rob you of your joy. You see, this king had a servant that owed him $7 billion. What could he do to collect that? Nothing. Therefore, he could either be upset about it and let his mind worry about it or be obsessed about it or go to his servant over and over again asking for the money or he could put him in jail or his family in jail. He could hold a grudge. But all that the king could really do was just hindering the king from enjoying his life. Keeping him from the opportunity to rule his kingdom and to rule it well. He could not keep on holding on to this debt and live like he's supposed to. And that might be what's happening to you today if you fail to forgive somebody. You have a job. You have a family. You have a life. You have a savior to serve. So don't live in the past. You can't do anything about it anyway. 
So get on with your life and enjoy it rather than enduring it and release yourself to forgiveness. Release yourself. Somebody said that unforgiveness is like a poison you prepare for somebody else and then you drink it yourself. Some of you may be carrying a burden for years, maybe 20, 30, 40 or more years. How does carrying that burden help you? I've had people tell me, there is no way I'll ever forgive them. And the question I'm asking is is this, who are you hurting? They don't care. Most of them don't care. So it's time to let go and let God take care of you. And then sixthly, forgiveness is your medicine. Forgiveness is a remedy for a lot of our problems. It may take some of your heartaches and sleeplessness and distractions and and headaches away. But unforgiveness, however, is a toxin. Unforgiveness is a poison. And it poisons the mind with an infection that distorts one's whole outlook on life. It breeds anger and resentment and sorrow and hatred. Unforgiveness pollutes the soul. It leads to evil appetites and evil thoughts. I think we all can understand the kind of evil thoughts that our mind can think up when we feel that we've been offended. Anybody ever hurt you really bad and you think to yourself, boy, I wish I could get back at them. And so in your mind, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? In your mind, you begin to think of ways that you can get back at them without them ever knowing. You would like to take a baseball bat and hit them upside of the head, but you know you can't do that and not get arrested. So you think of things that you can do. Oh, I'll spread rumors about them. I'll put some sugar in a gas tank. We try to, in our mind, there's this evil imagination. We have these sordid, nasty, evil thoughts of revenge. Because we want them to hurt like we've been hurt. <clears throat> On the other hand, forgiveness is a medicine. It is a cure. It's peace. It's sound mind. It's satisfying. Forgiveness is the laying down of a burden. Forgiveness is the release of a prisoner, and that prisoner is you. And with every offense, there comes a choice. Either you release them and get better, or hold on to them and get bitter. <clears throat> if you release them, you begin to heal. You hold on to them, you'll keep on hurting. Seventhly, forgiveness is your obligation. Listen, friend. Forgiveness is the obligation of the forgiver. Did you notice in our story that this man was forgiven of a $7 billion debt, but he didn't understand the lesson? There was a lesson being taught there. And so he went out and grabbed a man around the throat who owed him a smaller amount of money. In comparison to money today, the man was owed about 100 denarii or about four months' wages. In today's economy, it would be about $11,000, which is a, is a substantial debt, but nothing in comparison to $7 billion. So he grabbed him around the throat and said, unless you pay me my money, I'm going to throw you in prison. He was forgiven $7 billion, but he was not willing to forgive $11,000. Do you understand the lesson? Because the lesson is this. There is no one watching this broadcast or even in the entire world that has offended you more than you have offended God. Nobody. And if God can forgive you your millions of offenses that you've ever committed against Him, then surely you can forgive others of their few offenses that they have committed against you. Now, I think we all know that if a person comes to you and they are remorseful and they seek out your forgiveness, we understand how easy that is to forgive that person. They're remorseful, and we forgive them. There's restoration going on. But what about the person who's indifferent, who doesn't care? What are you going to do about that person? Well, try this. I'm going to give you a process of forgiveness, okay? Okay. Here it is. The first one, speak forgiveness out loud. Speak it out loud. If you can't say it to their face, it'd be wonderful if you could say it to the face, but you can't. Then just say it out loud. You know, there's something about speaking forgiveness that jumpstarts the healing process. 
There is something thera- therapeutic about taking the words out of your heart and mind, and speaking them into the air. Just say this, I forgive you. I forgive you. Hear yourself say the words, I forgive you. The second thing you can do is this. Trust in the healing power of time. Now, time doesn't heal all things. People say that. Well, time heals everything. Time doesn't. But with God and in time, all things can be healed. The problem we have most of the time is that our mind keeps bringing stuff back up. Our mind can race at breakneck speed. So you'll have to understand that the battleground that you're going to be fighting in is the battleground of your mind. Our our feelings through the passage of time can be taken care of by God. Ask God for his healing power as you take every day, one day at a time. Ask God to not only heal your heart that has been damaged, but to heal your mind as well. And oftentimes we tried to do something prematurely and we weren't prepared in our hearts to know what to say or to receive what is said by the other person. So allow God in time. Allow God in time to begin this process of healing. <clears throat> the next thing you can do is this. Fill your mind with positive thoughts. Please understand that the battleground for forgiveness is in your mind. and The best way to rid your mind of negative thoughts is to fill your mind with positive and uplifting thoughts. Fill it with positive thoughts to think on and positive things to do. Read the Bible. Fill your mind with godly thoughts. Meditate on His Word. Listen to it on tape or read a Christian book. What you're doing, you are renewing your mind. You're replacing the unforgiveness and the carnal nature of unforgiveness with spiritual thoughts and God's forgiveness. You are diverting your anger and turning it into love. So occupy your mind with forgiveness and positive thoughts. Understand that the battleground for forgiveness is in your mind. The fourth thing you can do is this. Lance the wound. You ever had something that had to be lanced? You know, you got um, some sore or something that's filled up with pus. And what they do, they lance it so I say the hurt can come out. And hurt is like an oozing wound full of pus that must be lanced. There, there will not be healing until the hurt comes out. And how is this done? Well, the best way is prayer. There is something wonderful about sharing your thoughts with God. You can journal and write down your thoughts. That's one avenue for you. Or you can have a trusted friend that you can share your thoughts with. And don't be afraid that they're gonna, this friend will shout it from the rooftop. All, by all means then, if, you're, if you trust this friend, intimately share your hurts with that person. And here's what will happen. Little by little, over time, God will help in the healing of the hurt. Jesus said... Some things can only be accomplished by prayer and fasting. That is the truth that you need to understand. It may do you good to dedicate yourself to prayer and fasting if if you want your healing to come about. It may come about slowly, but it may come about. Listen, healing is a process, and it takes time. The fifth thing you can do is this. Start cleaning house. What I mean by that is get rid of everything in your mind and everything in your surroundings that reminds you of the hurt and pain. Get rid of that to-do list. You know what I'm talking about is that list of revengeful things that you want to do to that person. Get rid of that list. Cleaning house is not avoidance, but it's a removing of temptation. Throw away all the old letters. If somebody has hurt you by a letter, throw the letter away. Trash any hurtful emails. Delete any social media that may be reminders of the pain. Do not join the same gym that your ex-husband works out in. Do not continue to have a bosom buddy fellowship with somebody that has betrayed your trust. Clean house. I think you understand what I'm talking about. The sixth thing you can do is this. Dwell on your positive past. Not your negative. Dwell on your positive past. Remember those things that are positive in your life. Remember how good it used to be before the hurt. Every day, write down something good from the past 
that you can cling to. Set a goal. Move toward that goal. How can I make things better? Ask yourself, how can I go back and do the things of the past that have been positive in my life? Whatever it may be, do those things. The seventh thing you can do is this. Feel good about yourself. One of the byproducts of being betrayed or being hurt or being damaged or being betrayed is kind of a warped concept of who you are. Do something to improve your life. Get a hobby, start cooking, lose weight, work out, go to school, do something. The problem is when we're hurt, we have a tendency to stay there and wallow in it. And we find ourselves unable to get out of the rut that we've dug for ourselves. You have choices to make. God has given you a shovel. And with that shovel, you can either make the rut deeper or you can dig yourself out and cover up the rut. Number, number eight, remind yourself of your own imperfections. Now, everybody is flawed. Everybody is flawed. We're, we're all fallen creatures. And just like you expect to be forgiven by God and be forgiven by other people, please understand that sometimes other people make mistakes and they hurt you. Realize that they're just like you. They had their imperfections. They need to be forgiven as well. Everybody deserves to be forgiven, not only by God, but by others. And then, number nine, replace your hurt with love. Whenever we have been hurt or betrayed or abused, love is diminished. Love that is diminished must be replaced. Your love reservoir needs to be filled. And the person that can fill it the most is God. He can fill it adequately. When I pump gas, I know it says on the gas pump, don't top it off. But I can't, for some reason, I can't believe that my tank is full unless it overflows. Listen, when you allow God's love in your heart and he fills you up to overflowing, that overflow will expand into this act of forgiveness. Ask God to fill your heart with his everlasting love. And the tenth and the last thing that you can do is realize this. Forgiveness may be a process. Forgiveness may be a process. You see, sometimes we can forgive in an instant, but in most cases it takes a while. There is no formula for forgiveness, only a process. You see, these ten previous pragmatic, practical things that I've shared with you are only suggestions. Some may help, others may not. A couple of years ago, God shared this with me when I was looking for a formula for overcoming hurt in this forgiveness process. God shared with me that the reason there's no formula in overcoming hurt is that the forgiveness process is different for different people. Everybody must find their own way. It is a process that makes us strong. It is not a formula. Several years ago, my mother, who's already went to be with the Lord now, she had a a major stroke. And when she first went to rehab after coming out of the hospital, uh, our dear friend Rhonda Stevens, who's a member of our church, brought her some cocoons. As you know, Rhonda, if you know her, has a butterfly farm. She ships butterflies all over the world. So Rhonda brought these cocoons that hung in a jar next to mom's bed. And after many days, my mom couldn't do much but kind of look around, and she saw the butterflies, and and there was a beautiful butterfly in that jar. And then there was another one. And slowly, one by one, these butterflies escaped from their cocoons, and they were set free. We took them outside. We released them to fly. All became butterflies but one. For days, one cocoon was left. Our thought was that this potential butterfly was dead and that it was best to throw away the cocoon. But one day we noticed that there was some movement and realized that the cocoon was not dead. My sister suggested that we give the butterfly a little help to get out, but I said no, and here's why. I once read that the struggling that a butterfly goes through to escape the cocoon is actually a positive thing. The struggling helps the butterfly strengthen his wings. And without a struggle, the butterfly will never be strong enough to fly. 
If we help it, we're actually hurting it. And you might be struggling today. Everybody listening? You might be struggling today. When you look at yourself, you may feel dead inside. For others, it looks like your life may be at the point of being trashed. For others, you've cocooned yourself away from life altogether. But to be honest, you're finding your own way. Just don't give up. It'll come to you. If your choice is to forgive, it will come to you. If you work and struggle and don't give up, you'll be able to forgive. You see, it's the struggle that makes you fly and soar above the earth, above the horizon. It's the struggle that strengthens you to fly above the earthly restraints of forgiveness. And you can soar up to God in the heights and rewards of forgiveness. But Brother Joe, it's hard. And my response to that is usually, we'll do something hard. Everything in life is not easy. In fact, most things that are of value are very hard. In a few days, the cocoon was empty. And we looked in that jar, and there was a beautiful butterfly. We took that jar outside, and that beautiful butterfly flew away. And in my opinion... That butterfly was more regal and more majestic than the others that we released earlier. And I'm not saying it's easy to forgive. It is a struggle sometimes. When somebody has hurt you deeply, it's a struggle to forgive. But you can forgive. You can. It's a hard thing, but you can forgive. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. God, you're gracious to us. Take care of this time of invitation. And Lord, we know there are people who are struggling. Some of them have struggled for years. There are people that have hurt them, and those people don't even care. Lord, help them to forgive them regardless. Help them to know it's not about the person, but it's about their heart and their relationship with you. And so, Father... Take control now. We thank you for the greatest forgiveness that we've ever received. And that was the initial forgiveness of our sin. When we invited you to come into our heart and be our Savior. When we committed ourselves to you, you forgave us. We are so thankful that you've done so. May we be forgiving to others as you have been forgiving to us. Lord, Lord, you know, we can't even count the times we've hurt you. But every time you've forgiven. May we be not people who are counting the offenses, but people who are willing to forgive. So, Father, begin to convict our hearts today. There may be somebody in the past. And we might even think we've forgiven them, but today has been brought to light in your heart that You have not. Forgive them today. Say it out loud. That your relationship with Christ. Would be what it ought to be. And you can free yourself. From being the prisoner of the person. Who has offended you. Let's sing together. Our invitation. You come. Lord I surrender.
thank you so much for viewing this broadcast. I guess I'm getting a little hoarse uh, from yelling at you. I'm so thankful that you have been here and you've been a part of our church today, even though you may be watching from home or watching on your phone in some other way. I notice there are many people, many people look at our, our uh, broadcast in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And we're thankful for that. I'm so thankful for the hundreds of people that have looked and viewed all these broadcasts. But many more people than we have in our church on the Sunday. So we thank God for that. And we know that it affects even more when it says number of views. There could be four or five people in the same family viewing it at one time. So we are thankful that you're a part of us. And we feel like you're a part of our church as well. If you have any needs, please call the church office. Uh, we are willing to help in any way. We do not have a timetable when we're going to be meeting together or even a, even a plan yet. We're talking about it. We're trying to get some help from other places. But even when we do, we're going to continue these broadcasts. There will probably be live streaming in the future. And so we're, we're so thankful for the many texts and uh, responses that we've gotten even on Facebook uh, for this broadcast. I want to thank everybody who puts it together every single week for Don and Ken and Scott and who else is up there? Devin, Devin up there. Thank you, Devin and, and Berta. And they've just been awesome uh, helping us out. And for the faithfulness of our praise team, for Brother Mark and, and uh, Sister Joanne and Sister Carrie and our I'm going to mention them all since I haven't done it. And our instrumentalist, which is Brother Mitch and um, Brother Chris. And who else is over there? Brother Rick. And we're so thankful that you're a part of us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us this day and every day. We thank you for the blessings of being here with us. We love you now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. To the 